Good morning. I'm Debbie Cafazzo, president of the Board of Trustees of Tahoma UU Congregation, and I'd like to welcome everyone here. Those of you from the 253, as well of the, the as well as those who are joining us from outside our home base. We welcome all who open their hearts to peace and justice, especially for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who bear some of the heaviest burdens in our nation. We're a diverse congregation that honors the inherent worth and dignity of every person and encourages each person in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. If you like what you've heard so far, we've got five more amazing UU principles to live by. But first, a few announcements. On June 21, that's two Sundays from now, we will celebrate our virtual flower communion. And you are invited to send a photo of yourself and family members to, um, to Arian, our uh, ministerial intern. And if you give me a second, I'm going to paste her email address into the chat box here and you can always uh, look it up on our website I think um, but it's simple it's ministerial.intern at tahomauu.com so send us a picture of yourself your family members with flowers and please be creative next week June 14th is our first ever virtual TUUC annual meeting Watch the e-news for a Zoom link and lots more information coming your way. And uh, also want to remind you that the um, UUA General Assembly um, is also taking place online this year uh, between June 24th and 28th. There's information about paid registration events and also events you can watch online for free at the UUA website. And uh, the general website is uua.org. But I'm going to paste in another website that will get you to more specifics about GA. And I invite you to follow us, TUUC, on Facebook. Links to the video version of this service and other important and inspiring messages will be posted there as well. And please continue to watch the e-news for your inboxes. Now let us gather in worship. Good morning, everyone. The wires and Wi-Fi light up. You click on the link, then the waiting room opens and our chalice appears. Soon there are voices and faces, typed hellos, greetings from others known and unknown. And here we are, missing the warmth of a handshake, missing looking into each other's eyes, missing the comfort of a smile, the warmth of a handshake, the delight of a hug, or just that friendly nod that lets you know that you are seen and welcomed. We have found our way into this kind of community for these days. We are blessed to be here and to have this connection. And we gather, bearing all of what this time brings, fear, and anger, hope, loss, spaciousness, emptiness, and more than can be adequately named. Let there be room for all of us and for all of what we carry as we arrive here this day. Welcome to you, beloved friends, for all that we arrive with and for all who arrive with us. It is good to be together this morning.
or please join me as we read uh, our chalice lighting words. You can find the words in the chat. We light this chalice in deep respect for the mystery and the holiness of life, in honor and gratitude for those who have gone before, with love and compassion for those who dwell among us, and with hope and faith for the generations to come. All right. Good morning. I am Nancy Slocum. I'm the Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth here at Tahoma UU Congregation. This is our time for all ages, a time we set aside for a special story for the children and young people in our congregation. And we invite folks typically to come up to the front of the sanctuary to hear the story. So kids can gather around their computers and their screens for the story. While you're doing that, I want to remind you that there will be a kids chapel today after the service at 1130. Um, I have sent a link out to the families uh, to link into that via Zoom. And if you did not get the link and want to get it, please email me. I'll paste my email into the chat when I am done here, uh, and I will send it to you. So in today's service, we are talking about grief. And grief is that sadness that you feel when you, you feel a deep loss of some sort. It, it's more than just feeling sad. Um, like the way you may, may feel sad if you're planning a bike ride with your friend and it starts pouring rain outside and you don't get to go. That makes you sad, but then you find something else to do and you, you get over it. Grief is a sadness that happens when we lose something or more often someone very dear to us. Perhaps someone moves away, or perhaps they die. Maybe some of you have experienced loss of a grandparent or a pet or someone else dear to you. The sadness we can feel can stay with us for a very long time. That is grief. Today's story is about grief, and it's from the Buddhist tradition. Buddhism is a religion that comes from uh, the area in the world that is now India, or maybe Nepal. They're not exactly sure where it started. Um, you might have your parents show you on a map or a globe where this region of the world is if you don't know where India and Nepal are. And Buddhism started a very, very long time ago, nearly two and a half thousand years ago. They don't really know exactly when it started because before they were keeping records, but it was a long time ago. And the spiritual leader of Buddhism is called the Buddha. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. Our story is called the parable of the mustard seed. A parable is a story that helps us learn about the world. It gives us something to think about. So in our story, a woman named Kisa Gotami was very, very sad. She was grieving. She was feeling so much grief. Her beloved son had died. She couldn't even believe he was dead. This often happens when we lose a loved one. You just can't even believe it's real. And she kept asking everyone if they had some special medicine that might make them well again. She was asking everybody, and finally a friend said to her, you know, you have a very special need here. You might go talk to the Buddha. He may have some wisdom to share with you about this. So she went to the Buddha and she asked him if he could help bring her son back. For she was feeling so sad. And he said, I think I can help you. What you need to do is bring me a tablespoon of mustard seeds. Now, do you know what mustard seeds are? They're these little teeny tiny seeds from the mustard plant. And they're, they're little. And uh, it would take a lot to make up a tablespoon of mustard seeds. And they're used for cooking. And I bet you can guess they're also used for making mustard. So he said, I want you to bring me a tablespoon of mustard seeds. But each mustard seed must come from a different household. And each of those households must have never experienced death and grief. Well, Kisa was so excited at the thought that the Buddha could help her that she ran off to her village and she started knocking on doors. And she went to the first one. 
house and she knocked on the neighbor's door and she asked if she could have a mustard seed. Of course, of course, said the woman who answered the door. And Kisa got so excited, she thought, oh, this is gonna be easy. Everybody here is so generous. They will certainly share their mustard seeds with me. I'll get my tablespoon of mustard seeds in no time. But then Kisa remembered the special instructions, instructions that the Buddha had given her. And it said, oh, but it needs to be from a home that has not experienced grief. And the woman at the door looked at her sadly and said, oh, oh, we have had grief here. My father passed away last year and we still grieve his loss. He was such a fine man and we miss him dearly. Kisa was very sad, but before she left, the woman said, may I give you a hug? Because I can tell that you are grieving. Perhaps a hug will help. So Kisa, Kisa allowed herself to be hugged and allowed herself to feel the warmth and comfort from the woman and went on to the next house. When she got to the next house, she noticed they were celebrating a birthday. And she thought, oh, this is great. If they're celebrating, it means they don't have grief. She knocked on the door and she made a request for a mustard seed and wanted to verify that there was no grief in the household. And the man who had answered said, I would love to share a mustard seed with you, of course, but we have felt grief in this household. My dear brother died a couple of months ago and I just miss him so much. He said, was confused by this because they were celebrating. And he replied, yes, yes, they feel free but they also have things to celebrate and that life continued even while feeling the grief. Lisa continued throughout the village and it was always the same. As people talked about the people they had lost, Kisa began to realize that the grief she'd been feeling, even though it was her own, was something everyone had felt. Grief had touched everyone in the village. But she also noticed that in people's grief, they continued to live their lives continued loving each other, continued celebrating, and continued enjoying life. And as people expressed sympathy to her about the loss of her son, she began to feel the support of her village, and it did help her feel a little bit better. Kisa returned to the Buddha and told him about her experiences. She said she realized now that the Buddha would not be able to bring her son back, and that she would always feel sad that he was gone. But she also knew that she would go on with the support of her friends and neighbors. That is the Buddhist parable of the mustard seed. This story, it focused on Kisa's grief at the loss of her child. But I want to make sure that everybody knows that grief can happen for all kinds of losses, not just when there's been a death. I know I've been missing getting together with friends these days because of the stay at home order and it's gone on so long that missing them, is, it feels like grief to me. And I see my granddaughter look longingly at her friends playing across the street and knows she can't join them. She's feeling grief. I can't go out to things that I like to do like camping and movies and that makes me sad and it's going on a long time and it feels like grief. So grief is something that happens for all kinds of reasons. Whenever we feel some kind of a loss, it's normal, it's, it happens. But it is also something that we want to make sure that if we're feeling it, that we reach out to people. Just as Kisa felt the warmth and the support of our neighbors. So if you are feeling that, if you feel like you're sad and it's not going away, if it feels like grief, please reach out to your parent or to a trusted adult. Kisa felt better when her neighbors offered support. And talking to someone else can really help. This is the end of our time for all ages. As we send the kids off, as we do when they're in the sanctuary, I'd like to remind us of the words we sing to them. We hold you in our love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. We nurture the spark of your precious life. We hold you in our love as you go. Thank you.
Now is the time we offer our financial gifts to the work of this congregation. Until we are together again, we are suspending our Share the Plate guest organization and will resume once we gather physically in our worship space. Thank you for your consideration to support our church during this uncertain and volatile time. You may follow the link in the following slide to contribute your support to our church members and staff working tirelessly to keep our congregation connected in new and dynamic ways. Every little bit helps, and while we are physically apart, our gifts are stronger together. And you can easily find that information in the chat. Talking to grief. Ah, grief. I shouldn't treat you like a homeless dog who comes to the back door for a crust, for a meatless bone. I should trust you. I should coax you into the house and give you your own corner, a worn mat to lie on, your own water dish. You think I don't know you've been living under my porch? You long for your real place to be ready for, for before winter comes. You need your name, your collar and tag. You need the right to warn off intruders, to consider my house your own and me your person and yourself my own dog. Denise Levertov, thank you. A few weeks ago, <clears throat> I was able to be part of the Festival of Homiletics. Can you believe that there's such a thing as a Festival of Homiletics? It's kind of like a comic con for preachers. Um, usually it's five days filled with preaching and workshops on how to do it better um, of community and connection for those who speak from pulpits. I've never been able to go, though I've wanted to because it hits at a funny time in the year. But now that it was virtual and inexpensive, I signed up and went to learn and be fed by some of the best preachers there are. One of them especially struck home. The Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III is minister at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, a church um, that gained our attention, uh, for those of you who don't immediately recognize it, when it was the home to Jeremiah Wright and was the congregation where the Obamas were married and were raising their girls. They were regular attenders there. In this service, Dr. Moss spoke about grief, a topic that was more timely than I had expected. You know, I had an awareness of how much loss was going on. It was impossible to miss the loss. Routines smashed, contact with beloveds moved into small box on a tiny screen. The simple pleasures that we had enjoyed, a meal with friends, coffee hour at church, vacation, travel, all of it was gone until some unknown point in the future. But even more critically than that, for many of us, there were jobs lost, support systems dissolved, and no way to know when any of it would end. I knew it was there, like that dog under the porch, but hadn't adequately put a name to it. Perhaps you had that feeling too. And since I heard that, we've had the horror and the grief and the loss surrounding the murder of George Floyd, the drawing back of the curtain to reveal again to white people the America that we don't often see. Systemic racism is not new to black, indigenous, or people of color. That's the reality they live with all the time. The awakening of those of us who are white, and now this astonishing movement that has grown in the three weeks since his death is stunning. And from black, indigenous, and people of color, I have heard the cry of long held grief and anger that never stops because of the brutality of systemic racism. It never stops, friends, never stops. What a time we are living through, my friends. 
So in the midst of all of this, I offer to you the three wise perspectives that Dr. Moss offered in his sermon a few weeks ago, perspectives that help me in my grief these days. The first one is to remember that it is okay to mourn. It is okay to feel grief, to be stricken, to feel lost. We don't have to look good all the time. That image that Denise Levertov uses of an old dog really resonates with me. It's important to give grief a name of its own, a dish, a collar, a tag, a place that is warm and comforting. A wise mentor of mine once talked about the spiritual practice of welcoming. I've mentioned it before, reminding me that, when, that while we cannot change what is happening in the world, we can consciously make some choices about how we respond, how we are approaching what is happening. We get to choose how we come about what is happening in the world. And as we learn to welcome into ourselves those griefs, those pains, those sorrows, we find, I think, a better way to process through them, to make sense and to move forward in the world. Now, not, not unlike what Nancy was suggesting in her time for all ages, the second is more a prescription rather than a perspective, and that is to find someone to commiserate with. To whom do you speak about your grief? Who hears you? Who understands what has been lost? I'm a part of colleagues who gather once a month to share about our ministries and lives. And much of our time over these months has, has been spent in talking through the complex grief of this time. So much lost in so many ways. So who is it that you bring your grief to? Find a companion who can hear you and hear you and you who. Let me try that again. Find a companion who can hear you and who you can also hear into a more centered and whole place. The third suggestion that Dr. Otis suggested is to widen the frame of what you're seeing. To widen the frame of what you're seeing. In his sermon, Dr. Otis was preaching in his seemingly empty sanctuary of his congregation. And then as he began to speak in this portion of his sermon, the view widened out and suddenly we see that his wife is sitting in a pew just outside the frame of the video, just a few feet away. Like the woman whose grief is unending, the woman that, that uh, Nancy spoke about, that for her to be free, she has to make a potion by gathering mustard seeds from every house in the village where grief has not come. Widening our frame means recognizing that grief is universal. None of us remain untouched by grief and loss. When we pull back the frame, when we widen our view, when we give our grief a place, and when we have community in which we can acknowledge and voice our grief, we may find it easier to carry. When our grief is seen and held by another, when we have that wider view, and when we give ourselves permission to really feel it and to welcome it in. So I invite you now into a time when we can name and share our grief. In a few moments, we'll pause and then Nancy will begin by dropping um, 
dropping color into water set by our chalice and candles. As you are moved to do so, I invite you to name your grief in our chat, and Tim and I will read them aloud as Nancy continues to drop bits of color representing our griefs as we watch them spread and merge. But before that, let us pause in a moment or two of quiet together. Let us breathe in deeply and breathe out. Take a few more breaths as you begin to write and we'll begin. I invite you to share. The loss of all your faces. Roberta. The illusions that seemed so real before the pandemic hit. Feelings of powerlessness over hate and viruses. People hurt and killed because of the color of their skin. For what feels like the loss of everything I have ever known. Grief for all the minds and hearts that remained closed. For the ignorance that I have lived with. The inability to protest because of the virus. All those who suffer from the cruelty of some others. Grief for our youth who are coming of age in a time of great challenge. For the dozens of people killed by the state violence and the virus. Economic injustice. May my two black sons, Nat and Alex, and their families be safe at this time. The homeless on 72nd Street break my heart every day. Our society's inability to wrestle with its sins. Grief for the future generations. The loss of my father, mother, and many mentors and friends in my life. Grief for democracy. For the innocence of youth living in a world as it is right now. For comfort. The loss of the spirit of cooperation. For the fear of vulnerability and reaching out from isolation. The grief that I don't have answers for my black children. Our mother earth. Grief for longtime friends I have had to re release currently. Had to release recently. For Becca's stepmother's husband on his deathbed. It might be his last days in Julie's last days with Jim. For the inability to stand in hand with allies. The loss of the misperception of certainty. The loss of civility and empathy. Grief for those who choose to take their own lives due to overwhelming circumstances for the feeling of well-being. For Kathy Strickland's suffering. Grief for the loss 
of some of our democracy. All the events that we were going to have this year, vacations and the ability to visit family far away. Grief of the lost moments, taking for granted when things seem normal. Grief for the lack of unity in our nation. The separation from my new grandchild and the inability to create a relationship with her during the pandemic. Just being able to go to the store and buy my own groceries. Grief for all of our furry friends and love without condition. For being able to hug, for not being able to hug your grandchildren, Mary. Grief for that. For not being able to sing our children down to their classes. For all those in a domestic violence situation. Let us pause, my friends, for another moment or two. Having named our grief, having named what we are missing and losing, brown granddaughter being raised in a community where her face is not reflected for those without voice. So much grief. Let us witness and hold this together because when we are connected we are stronger when we are connected possibility opens for us i name one more the grief for limited courage and the ability to make a difference I invite you as we pause now, hearing all of this, knowing all of what we know, take a moment now to set an intention for how you will move from this grief out into the world to touch and bless it. Spirit of love and of life, Bless us and these our griefs. Sorrow seems unending as we find our way onward and through these challenging and changing times. Be with us here. Open our hearts to both the sorrow and the care and love all swirled into one whole. Help us to welcome it all, that which is bitter, that which cuts deep, that which is small and unimportant. We welcome it with tears, with the love that lives beneath it, naming it, owning it. Be here with us as we widen our view, see our companions, and always remember the love that underlies each grief. So may it be. Amen. And now, friends, yep. on this yeah. day, like all other days, let us part company knowing what it is that we must do to live in this world, to practice kindness always, to be ready to learn from each moment, to offer the world our gifts of love and attention. 
This day, like all other days, let us part company knowing what we carry with us always. The possibility of joy, the satisfaction of growth and new learning, the spirit of life ever abiding, and that we have our place in the interconnected web of all existence, and we are never alone. Let us go in peace and in love. Now please join us in our reading to extinguish the flame. This Nancy helps us. We extinguish this flame, but not the truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you. <laughs>